Hey, what up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Ari Temkin, and this is the Texas Football Orange Bloods YouTube channel. Go ahead and hit subscribe if you have not yet already, and ring the bell. That way you're always notified when we post new videos. And if you like what you're watching, give it a thumbs up, because that will help other people find the video as well. Today, we're recapping the weekend that was across the Big 12. Now, in addition to the work that I do here at Orange Bloods, I host a radio show on Sirius XM's Big 12 radio, so I'm well-versed be talking about all things Big 12 as we sort of survey the Big 12 landscape and where the horns currently fit into it. And obviously this is a big week. And so I'd like to ask all of you Texas fans watching this right now, what time is it? And when we want to sit back and analyze what we just watched week five and take sort of a big picture, 50,000 foot view, if you will, of the Big 12, I think the biggest thing that stands out is that this conference is now starting to take shape. It's starting to be obvious which teams are going to be in competition to win a Big 12 championships and which teams aren't. And a lot of the teams that we figured would be in this discussion for a Big 12 championship remain, and yet there are some surprises here. The top three teams after five weeks of play and two weeks of the Big 12 are clearly Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Texas. Baylor's right there. So is Iowa State with that sort of mid-tier to bottom tier of the Big 12 starting to take shape. We know Kansas is at the bottom. We know that West Virginia is probably somewhere just above them with Texas Tech, who's 4-1 and one and 1-1 one and one in conference play, but obviously has the one-sided teeth kicked in loss to the Horns a couple of weeks ago. And then there's K-State, who started conference play 0-2, despite being a pretty good football team. And then, of course, TCU losing to Texas this week is now 0-1 in conference play. So today we're going to be focusing specifically on that top five, who at this point in time clearly have separated themselves and have put themselves in the position to be Big 12 champions. That'd be Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Baylor, Texas, and Iowa State. Let's start with Oklahoma State because they've had the most impressive win of the week, knocking off previously undefeated Baylor um, in Stillwater on Saturday. And this was not the prettiest, most aesthetically pleasing game. And the score would probably indicate that. I think we need to recalibrate ourselves to understand that Oklahoma State really for the last year plus has been buoyed and really is leaned on the defensive side of the football. Hard to believe, hard to fathom, but that's the reality of the situation when it comes to Oklahoma State. Their offense trails their defense. Their defense is dominant. They've given up only eight touchdowns in five games this season. This week, they held a Baylor offense that's averaging 273 yards on the ground to just over 100 yards rushing. Now, look, I'm not trying to say that Baylor is the bastion of offensive firepower, this is a team that, again, is rushing the ball for about 300 yards a game, and that's all they want to do. They don't put many opportunities on the plate of Gary Bohannon to go make plays with his arm. But still, this was a 4-0 football team that had a very impressive victory to start Big 12 play against Iowa State. So defensively, Oklahoma State is stout. Very, very good. That's the strength of their football team and has for quite some time. It's not a fluke. It's over a year now where their defense has really um, been the dominant force uh, behind their winning and success. Spencer Sanders, still a ton of talent, but still Spencer Sanders giveth, Spencer Sanders taketh. Spencer Sanders against Baylor had three interceptions. Two of them were on him. The last was on Rashad Owens, who should have caught a ball that was thrown in his hands. Instead, he bobbled it up and it became a pick. First throw is a really bad, basically close your eyes and pray that somebody catches it off your back foot on a third down situation. Not a good throw. His second pick was just a missed throw. And uh, the third one, again, wasn't on him. But sprinkled in with all those bad plays and bad throws was a really good running attack from maybe the best running back you've never heard of in Jalen Warren, who's really taken over as one of the best backs in the Big 12 behind, you know, Brees Hall and Bajan Robinson at this point, but still up there in that upper tier. Um, and then additionally, Spencer Sanders has been a really good part of the rushing attack, and he picked up multiple first downs with his legs and is still savvy to be able to pick up and the athleticism to break tackles and pick up first downs with his legs. But he also made some ridiculous throws. He made a ridiculous throw for a touchdown pass to Rashad Owens earlier in the game, a 32-yard touchdown pass. That was just it was incredible. The back of the end zone and just dropped it exactly where it needed to go. So he's a wild card here because he does turn the ball over and he's going to turn the ball over. But in the middle of turning the ball over, he takes chances and, and makes some ridiculous throws. And they have the weapons. You know, Tay Martin, when he's been healthy, and the three games that he's fully played is 100 yards receiving in all three of those games. Oklahoma State, when we're looking at the top three teams in this conference right now, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, and Texas, they, they definitely have the best defense of the three, but the most questionable offense 
of the three. Probably the second best running back of those three, but the third best quarterback, most questionable quarterback. And by the way, still a great coach, Mike Gundy, who say whatever you will about him. This is a guy that I love the call that he made at the end of this football game. Now, Sanders at the end of this game was facing a third and 12 right on the doorstep of the goal line of Baylor. The Cowboys were up by three points. It was a third and 12, and Sanders scrambled, was able to pick up 10 really hard-fought yards, got absolutely destroyed on that run, but fell just two yards shy of the first down marker. Remember, Oklahoma State's up three. There's about two minutes to go in this football game. So they could kick the field goal and depend on a really good defense and play not to lose, as many coaches across college football do. But Mike Gundy, being the savvy, aggressive, shoot-from-the-hips kind of coach that he is, decided, let's go for it without even a great offense to speak of, but an offensive line and a running back fully capable of winning the football game. And at the end of the day, that's what you want your coach to do. Take chances being aggressive in trying to win as opposed to making plays, trying not to lose. And that's exactly what Mike Gundy did. He called for a run for Jalen Warren on fourth and two, and it paid off. Jalen Warren went into the end zone and Oklahoma State won the game because of it. All right, Oklahoma and Kansas State. Oklahoma survives and wins, even though Kansas State made a late push in this game. And I think the initial reaction from this game is that Kansas State took a huge risk in this game, and it nearly paid off. Kansas State got a touchdown to to pull with the within 10 points. And Chris Kleiman, being the Kleinastic Kleinasty that he is, special teams ace, decided to unveil a really awesome straight-ahead chase-the-ball onside kick from his kicker, and it worked. He recovered it. The only problem was he kicked it, and then in trying to run alongside it, he double-kicked the ball. So he touched it a second time, which, upon review, meant that Oklahoma would get the football. No big deal. Spencer Rattler then turns the ball over a few plays later, so Kansas State gets it back, trailing by 10. Kansas State then drives all the way to the Oklahoma 48. They call a delayed run play to Deuce Vaughn that gets snuffed out immediately and then face a fourth and eight from about midfield and throws a pretty good pass. Skyler Thompson does, and it's called a completion. looks like a completion, first down, except that when they reviewed it, they noticed that the pass catcher, Landry Weber, actually used the ground to help him catch it. It was a ridiculous catch. It looked real, it looked good in real time, except that it wasn't. So two plays in this game, bang, bang, they go against Kansas State after review, and Oklahoma made the plays throughout the course of the football game in order to win it. Once again, the offense didn't blow you away with Oklahoma, with the exception of a few passes that Spencer Rattler made. In fact, Spencer Rattler threw a ridiculous touchdown pass the second half of this game. He had to step up to avoid the rush, was moving to his right, and was able to throw on the run, just throw an absolute dime that was just placed right into the breadbasket of Mike Woods, the receiver who caught it and even had two feet in bounds before falling out of bounds. Would have been a catch in the NFL. It was a ridiculous throw. And it was one of those throws where you're like, mm, come on, Oklahoma fans, talk dirty to me. Call for Caleb Williams again, baby. I want to hear it. This is just a ridiculous throw. Now, Rattler only threw three incompletions. He had over 250 yards passing and two touchdowns. He did throw that pick. Nothing blows you away in terms of the running game. Kennedy Brooks, uh, Eric Gray, good runners, but nothing even close to what we're used to seeing from an OU offense. And that's the problem. Their offensive line's not great. Therefore, it's affecting the running game and, and the, the style that Lincoln Riley plays with from an offensive perspective, even though it's an air raid offense or it has principles of an air raid offense, it's very much a run centric air raid type offense. And so when they're not running the ball effectively, they're in big trouble. And that's why they haven't even scratched the surface of their potential on offense. Now, Oklahoma is still really, really good in their defensive front, and they can really do things to mess you up in terms of your running game and in terms of your pass protection. They will get after the quarterback, and they certainly made life uncomfortable for Skylar Thompson throughout this game. Now, Thompson wasn't even expected or supposed to start here. He suffered a knee injury a couple of weeks ago, and there was no indication that he was going to play, and he played and actually played pretty well in this game. There's nothing here that scares you, though, about Oklahoma. I mean, really, quite frankly, aside from their defensive line that gets after you. But normally, we're used to going into this game thinking that Oklahoma is a fire-breathing dragon on offense. How on earth is anybody supposed to stop that? And at this point in time, things could change when we get to Saturday at the Cotton Bowl. But at this point in time, Oklahoma's offense looks kind of like Texas's offense. Times it looks really good. Times it looks like it has no idea what it's doing. 
But Oklahoma doesn't have Bajan Robinson. I'd still say that Oklahoma is the team to beat or the best team in the Big 12. And maybe it's just blind faith that it will work out on offense because it has always worked out on offense with Lincoln Riley and Rattler does have all kinds of talent. But you can make a pretty cogent case for any of these three teams as being the team to beat or the best team in the conference right now. And as everybody's watching this already knows, it doesn't really matter to be the best team in the conference right now. Now, I passed over talking specifically about Baylor, even though I talked about Oklahoma State and that Baylor-Oklahoma State game. And Baylor is still a good football team at 4-1. and one. They have a really good defense. Stop me if you've heard that before now in the Big 12. It's pretty remarkable, actually. Most of these teams that we talk about are really good on defense with a stout running game, but an ineffective or inconsistent passing game. I, I don't know what bizarre world I've landed in, but the Big 12 has changed pretty dramatically. And Baylor is no different. Baylor is really good. Um, on the defensive side of the football, uh, they've got one of the best defensive linemen and certainly one of the best true nose tackles of the Big 12 in Apu Aika, who transferred with Dave Aranda this past year uh, to go from LSU to Baylor. And then there's Jalen Petrie, who is certainly one of the best players in the Big 12 overall. Terrell Bernard, who actually missed this game, um, is a really, really good linebacker and has been for quite some time. So they're good on defense. And obviously, Dave Aranda is a defensive-minded head coach. They've been able to run the ball effectively. Preston Ebner and Abram Smith are two of the better backs in this conference. Uh, they're averaging 273 rushing yards a game, as I mentioned, but Oklahoma State held them to 100. And they just don't put enough faith in Gary Bohannon as a passer to be able to win when they're not running the ball effectively. And as I mentioned earlier, Mike Gundy, he has the cojones to go for the win in a fourth and two situation, as opposed to playing it safe and kicking the field goal to go up six points. Dave Rand is not there yet in terms of his aggression as a decision maker, as a play caller. They're just very conservative on offense. They were 0 for 6 on their first six third downs. They punted on their first eight possessions of this football game. And there was one instance late in this game with Baylor down by three points. Again, it's 17-14. Baylor's offense has not done much throughout the course of this football game. And they call a run play right up the middle on third and five with Abram Smith. Now, Abram Smith did have a 55-yard touchdown run on fourth and two, but aside from that, they had done nothing on offense in terms of being able to get their ground game going against that Oklahoma State defense. So they call for a run on third and five. Does it work? And now they're in a situation where they're in a fourth and four, and they decide to go for it. And if you watch the play, you're left wondering what the hell the play was. It first started off like it looked like it was going to be a throw, but I'm not really sure where, if anywhere, Gary Bohannon was looking or if there were even wide receivers designed to run patterns in the play. And then he sort of just bootlegs out to one side and was looking for a receiver to get open and runs out of bounds. It, it was just a very weirdly designed play where you're not even sure what the goal of the play was. And just set an example to me of young and experienced head coach that is over the course of a game, making conservative decisions in line with defensive minded running first type team. Now I get it. Your identity is to run the football and that's what you try to do in various third down situations, but you have to adjust your approach based on how the game is playing out. And even though you are identified, your identity is a running football team. In this game, you weren't really able to run the ball effectively. So you got to put the ball in Gary Bohannon's hands in order to try to win the game at some point. And they just didn't do that enough. And that's why though, I think Baylor will continue to be a top half of the big 12 type team. It's hard for me to think that they have the upside to win this conference based on their performance in this game against Oklahoma State. Really good defense, but can they come up with enough plays on offense in order to push up against good offensive football teams with smart offensive tacticianers in Texas and Oklahoma? And then the fifth, which is the game we haven't really had a chance to talk about, and that's Iowa State, who laid into a FCS-level team that plays the Big 12. That's the Kansas Jayhawks. And what can you gauge – from an Iowa State team that fell in their Big 12 opener to Baylor that then lays the wood the following week to Kansas, like everybody else does. Not sure, but like we've talked about with these other teams, good defense, really good running game. And they may actually have a better defense, Iowa State, than Oklahoma State. It's up for debate on who has the better defense, but certainly both of them are in the conversation. And Brees Hall right there in terms of the best running back in this conference and in the country led the league he led, led the country in rushing last year. But again, I trust their passing offense probably more so than I would the Baylor passing offense. But all we've seen from Brock Purdy in his career is blatant inconsistencies. And beyond that, 
They've got Xavier Hutchinson on the outside, but not much in terms of weapons on the outside. One thing's for sure. Texas is Oklahoma this week and Oklahoma State the following week. So if Texas is trying to punch their ticket to Arlington and have a shot at the Big 12 championship, they at least have to win one of these next two. And for them to be in the driver's seat and to really restore faith, this team is back to being a Big 12 championship contender. It'd be nice to see them win back-to-back games and go for five straight. We'll see. I'm Ari Temkin. Thanks for checking out today's video as we go around the Big 12. Make sure if you liked what you watched, and if you're watching this long, chances are you liked what you watched, give it a thumbs up. Also consider hitting the subscribe button and ring the bell. That way you're always notified when we post new videos.